Okay, so welcome to the tutorial on Todd Graph Foundation Model. So what is the driving force for this big AI revolution? First of all, we have this technology advance. There is powerful model like transformer becoming available. Also, the availability of big data. There's a lot of data which is actually generated by ourselves from a social network. And a lot of the work has also been moved online. So there are all kinds of data now becoming available to train models. And also now we have very powerful GPU. So if you worry about our stock price, you can see this NVIDIA stock price is one of the rules. So everyone is trying to buy this powerful GPU. And certainly more data will be able to train more powerful model, but the improvement actually is super linear. When you train a model with really a lot of data, the performance will jump. Okay. So that is a very unique phenomenon, actually. So unexpected, but you will sometimes saw those there's a diminishing marginal return. So in this new era, since 2021, right? Now we have very huge neural network with hundreds of layers. And then we have a vast amount of training data and also massive amount of GPU. So this open a new area of foundation model. So what is the foundation model? A foundation model is a model that train a broad data and can be adapted to a wide range of downstream tasks. So the big idea here is that we pre-train a very powerful model, right? And then we can fine tune it for, for specific tasks, what the user are interested in. And it revolutionized many different domains like language, video. Uh, some representative example, for example, the, the large language model. Oh, if we look at just a couple of years ago, like around maybe 2018, back, uh, we have this ELMO, right? It, it only had millions of parameters. But now, when we look at GPT-4, it has trillions of parameters, right? So you can see the progress is really uh, fascinating. Right? And then on the video side, now, the story just come out that right? really catch everybody's eyes. So in this tutorial, we're going to talk about graph foundation model. So a graph foundation model is a model pre-trained on extensive graph data and be adapted to diverse downstream graph tests. So, the major motivation here is that uh, to develop graph foundation model is that existing LLM really struggle to model graph data. The graph data actually is non Euclidean. And Euclidean space is best, best able to model grid data. It, it has a, a zero uh, curvature. But the graph data actually is better modeled by some other type of uh, geometric space. And then there's some recent work find that you know, when you represent the graph data in a parabolic space, or the hyperbolic space you know, has a negative curvature of minus one. Right? Uh, it is best suited for modeling pre-type structure. In this context, the uh, type of paper on mapping this uh, graph data into this uh, general Riemannian space. Okay. 
that are actually allowing you to model different structure of the Quran in different curvature. Why you have a uh, why you look at uh, model every edge with a different curvature, this actually give you uh, a lot of uh, power. Okay? So we actually can uh, model this uh, uh, irregular shape. Uh, shape data, so not only for graph data, but many more uh, image data. Okay. And then, so another problem is that EZDL and struggle to handle uh, graph task. Okay, uh, the graph task actually in a different level. Level task you can have edge level task, and then you also have the whole graph. So, school of the Kotorich, right? So we'll first go through the concept of graph foundation model and the reason, uh, reason progress. So we'll go over the GNN based uh, model, the LN based uh, graph model, and then the GNN uh, and combined model. And then we're going to talk about future direction. Okay. So, so I basically uh, uh, provide introduction and then I, and Professor Shikram will, will talk about, go over, give you an overview. And then Professor Tia will talk about the GNN. In fact, it's going to talk about LN and based model. And then we're going to have a panel discussion at the end. Okay, so Professor Shikram. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank uh, Professor Yu. Uh, good evening. A uh, brief introduction. Uh, in this section, I will give a detailed overview of uh, this tutorial. Uh, this is uh, the outline of this section. Firstly, I will, I will pre uh, present the concept of a graph foundation model, and then I will uh, give an introduction of the pro progress in the related work. Uh, finally, uh, I will present the challenge and the huge direction of this promising direction. Okay, uh, as Professor Yu has said, uh, our foundation model is um, a model that is trained on uh, broad data and can be adapted to a wide range of downstream tasks. Um, this concept is proposed by uh, Stanford uh, University in 2021. Um, foundation model has become a reality in the domains like language, uh, vision, and uh, speech. For example, the GPT-4 and the flow in OpenAI. Uh, foundation model has uh, two characteristics. Uh, the first one is uh, emergency. Uh, as the foundation model scales up, uh, it uh, manifests the novel capabilities. And another one is uh, uh, homogenization. Uh, that means the model's uh, versatility uh, enable it's uh, deployed across diverse applications. That means we only need uh, one model to solve what kind of tasks. Let's briefly uh, record the effects uh, driving the foundation model success. Uh, uh, from the data uh, perspective, uh, the incre increasing number of data collect collecting device result, uh, results in a massive growth in the data volumes. Uh, and the rapid advance, uh, advancement of the GPU uh, as you has pointed out. Um, from the learning perspective, the self-supervised learning uh, employing the raw enabled data uh, and the transformer architecture uh, use the attention mechanisms uh, can uh, handle all kinds of data. Uh, as a typical represented uh, representation of the foundation model, uh, large language model um, refers to a uh, pre-trained language model with a massive 
uh, permits and uh, typical representative uh, uh, and uh, it has be it has achieved the great success. Uh, the LM uh, you cast the pay AI abilities like the comprehension, generation, a logical and memory uh, it hinted at the path toward the artificial general intelligence. We know that the input of LM is the uh, language data. Uh, for example, the text uh, or the spoken uh, content in human language, uh, it, it is a sequence data. Uh, the data has uh, also leading structures. And the backbone uh, is mostly based on the transformer. Uh, it um, uh, pre-trained uh, with the protects the uh, protect part, uh, mostly uh, based on the next word uh, prediction. A uh, uh, large language model can be um, can be applied to so many downstream tasks. Uh, uh, for example, the machine translation and uh, uh, sentiment analysis. Yeah, one model can solve what kinds of uh, language uh, task. On the other hand, uh, let's talk about the graph. A uh, graph, a uh, general language for describing uh, the modeling com complex uh, treatment, such as the social network, economic networks. A graph uh, has a very simple definitions. Uh, it is an um, ordered pair, V and E, where V is the node, node set, and E is the edge set. Uh, graph machine learning refer to the application of machine learning to graph data. Uh, uh, it was also known as the graph learning or graph models. The graph has a long uh, research history uh, from the uh, seven bridge of uh, Comburg um, in in uh, seventeen hundred and uh, thirty six. Um, um, uh, recently, uh, we uh, studied the graph for new networks. Uh, it has a very uh, long history. Yeah. In, uh, in recent years, a basic task for a graph is uh, to learn the structure, uh, learn the structure representation of nodes. Uh, that is the graph representation, representation learning. Yeah. Uh, it means in, embed each node of a graph into a low dimensional vector space. The learned embedding can be sharing the wrong screen. Oh. You can see on my sorry for disturbing you. Oh. No, 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 this one. No, this one. You just have to press the uh, I don't know. This, this one? Yeah. This one? Okay. Can you move? Oh. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. How does that After we learn the embedding of a node, uh, which can be easily used for downstream tasks, uh, such as the 
community detection and the load classification. Um, graph representation learning is a hot research topic in recent years. Um, many models can, uh, have, have been proposed, uh, which can be roughly classified into the shadow model and the spin model. A typical shadow model is a random a uh, random work based uh, uh, mesh, uh, uh, which generate a uh, sequence of loads, uh, like the uh, what uh, what the sequence in in the what the uh, what embedding. And another type is a uh, um, deep model, um, a GNN, yeah, which uh, uh, employ the deep learning for uh, graph data. Uh, it has been uh, based on artificial intelligence techniques uh, beyond the graph data. Uh, let's see some key point of the graph or neural network. Um, the first one is the data, the graph data. Um, uh, it's a uh, long uh, or leading data. Since each node has a um, Fix the labels, uh, while the image, image data has a fixed grid, grid structure, and the language data has a fixed sequ uh, sequence uh, structure. And the data, uh, graph data from various domain uh, have a totally different structures. Uh, for example, uh, the, the social network, and uh, molecules and uh, economies. Um, if in, uh, uh, moreover, different uh, modeling uh, paradigms constructing totally different uh, graphs. Uh, for example, the homogeneous graph, heterogeneous graph, and uh, uh, and uh, 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 type, uh, type graphs. Over, uh, the graph only has uh, three types of uh, tasks, uh, but with a totally different uh, format. Uh, the load level task consists the, the characteristics of a single node, such as the node classification, uh, node regression, and uh, clustering. The edge level task uh, consists the relation among the loads. Uh, such as the link prediction, shorted path prediction. And the graph level task consists the, um, the graph level task consists the, the characteristics of the whole graph, such as the graph classification, graph generation. Uh, these three type tasks have a totally different uh, uh, format with a total different uh, solutions. Uh, well, the language has uh, hundreds hundred of tasks, but with a uniform uh, format. Uh, what will happen uh, when graph model meet the large language model? Uh, we have solved this problem for a long time. Uh, we think the LM cannot solve the graph related uh, problems uh, because uh, it struggles to model graph structure semantics and the LM struggles to handle a uh, diverse graph or tasks. And uh, on the other way, the graph model don't uh, uh, post the uh, capability of LM. Uh, because the graph model has a limited compressive power uh, and it faces the, the over smoothing and the over stressing uh, challenges. Um, particularly, uh, the graph model lacks the emergency capability and cannot support the multiple tasks.
Concerning these issues, we propose the graph foundation model. Uh, this concept. Uh, a graph foundation model is a model constrained on a intensive graph data uh, adapted for diverse downstream graph tasks. The also has uh, two characteristics. Uh, uh, emergency. Uh, that means uh, it has a lower capability when large model or more graph data. It can, it also has the uh, graph reasoning uh, generation uh, ability. Uh, uh, another one is the uh, homogenization, uh, which means um, it can be applied to different formats of tasks, uh, such as the loader, energy, and graph level tasks. There are two key uh, te uh, techniques of uh, graph foundation model. Uh, the pre-train, um, that means the uh, neural network are trained on a large graph data in a self-supervised manner. Uh, we can employ the constructive uh, pre-train uh, or generative uh, pre-train technique. Uh, another tactic, uh, tactic is uh, adapting. Uh, we adapt between the models to specific uh, downstream tasks or domains to enhance their performance. Uh, we can uh, use the fine tuning or prompt uh, tuning techniques. Here. We compiled the graph foundation model and the large language models. Uh, they have some, uh, they have the same goal and uh, paradigms. Uh, they both use enhanced models expression power and uh, uh, the generalization across the various tasks. And they, they also has the um, um, pre-training and adapting uh, two states. However, uh, they have uh, the intrinsic uh, difference in data and uh, tasks. Um, the, we have said the large language model uh, handled the language uh, language data, which is uh, uh, which has a uh, oscillating structure. Uh, while the graph foundation model handled the graph, it has a uh, long use uh, structure. And the, the, the large language model um, handled the language task, uh, which has uh, uh, so many tasks, but uh, with, the, uh, with the same uh, formats. Uh, the graph foundation model has only three uh, type, three types of task, uh, but with uh, totally different uh, formats. This uh, intrinsic difference caused uh, some intrinsic uh, difference uh, uh, in the backbone architecture. Um, the large language model mostly based on transformer, uh, while the graph foundation model has no unified architectures until now. Um, and uh, LM is easy to uh, homogenization. Uh, but the uh, GFM is difficult to uh, homogenization. Um, until now, the LM uh, has shown the strong generalization capabilities, uh, but the GFM has a weak uh, generalization across the data set. Uh, last but, uh, uh, last but not the least, the LM has uh, demonstrated uh, emergent uh, abilities, um, but the GFM uh, has uh, no emergent abilities uh, until now. Then I will give a very brief introduction of progress in related uh, work. 
um, um, after my talk, uh, Professor uh, Yang Chen and uh, Fang Yuan will introduce uh, this uh, uh, progress in detail. We know that the uh, graph new network and the large language model both are hot topic in AI field. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say in the program, um, I found that there are three to borrow about the graph learning. Yeah, it's very hot topic in AI uh, in their field. Uh, yeah, and I also know um, in this modern but as a large language model uh, talk, uh, the, the talk. Uh, so uh, uh, only a few uh, audience come into uh, into this tutorial. Uh, yeah, yeah. This um, the team and I am both uh, very hard topic. Uh, very hard topic. However, there are few work on the graph foundation model. Uh, Fortunately, more and more researchers are uh, aware that graph foundation model is a, is a big uh, vision and a lot of exploration is on the way. We evening category, uh, categories the existing exploration into three distinct groups according to the dependence on G and LM. The gene-based models and the LM-based models, um, and the gene plus LM-based models. Uh, these mod, uh, these models have the different uh, backbone, pre-training uh, pre and adapting uh, street uh, strategies. Yeah. Uh, the gene-based model uh, seek to enhance the current graph learning uh, through the innovation, uh, innovative approach in gene model architecture pre-training and uh, adapting. And the LM-based model exploited the, the uh, feasibility of transforming graph into facts or tokens uh, to leverage LM as a foundation models. Gene plus LM based models employ the uh, uh, synergy between the gene and the IM to enhance the graph learning. Yeah. Finally, I will introduce the challenge and the future, uh, future di direction. In the model uh, perspective, um, there also remained a no whether the current architecture are, are op optimal uh, choice. Um, and can we use the graph to extend the multiple um, possibilities? Um, for the model training, uh, is there the uniform protective task for graph? Uh, Maybe we can learn some idea from other directions, such as the knowledge dis, uh, dis, uh, destination and reinforcement and learning and mod, uh, model editing. In the data perspective, um, there are limited amount of open source, la open source large scale graph data. Yeah. Uh, uh, this data running uh, con uh, concentrate the uh, in a single domain, um, and work, uh, we can use some uh, augment, uh, augmentation strategies such as the graph structure learning feature uh, com competition and the label uh, mixing. And another. Another important task is the model evaluation. Uh, we can try the human uh, evaluation and the meta uh, evaluations. Uh, we will also need to design some metrics to 
evaluate the robust uh, trustworthiness and uh, holistic uh, performance of, uh, of the CRM model. In the application perspective, uh, we did find the tailor applications of uh, CRM. Yeah, it's not yet clear that the self foundation model can similarly uh, catalyze the graph uh, ground blocking applications in graph tasks. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe we can find the uh, Kilo applications in urban computing or drug uh, de deployment. Last but not least, the model uh, safety issue is uh, also very important uh, uh, future directions. Uh, the black box uh, later introduced uh, uh, safety concerns uh, such as the uh, uh, policy uh, uh, hallucination uh, in the LM and uh, privacy leaks. Uh, the, we can also use some the um, promising tech, uh, technology such as the counterfeiting regions. Yeah, that's all. Um, thank you. So that uh, next part is uh, was uh, yeah. Good morning, everybody. I'm Chen Yang, and now I will present the GM based methods for the core foundation model. Uh, Professor have introduced that uh, major paradigm of graph foundation models. Typically, we will have a neural backbone, usually a neural network, a graph neural network to be pre-trained and then transformed to adapt to downstream tasks. So in this part, I will introduce this method from three aspects, namely uh, the neural backbone and pre-training method and adaptation methods. For neural backbone, we usually have two major categories of the backbones. The first one is typical mass passing. In mass passing paradigm, each node will aggregate the information from their neighbors in a relative order. But uh, in the graph transformer methods, the, the, the original graph structure is somehow ignored. The, each node will aggregate the information from a broader range of the, the neighborhood and even the entire graph. As a first step category, the mass passing is well known, so I will directly introduce from graph transformer part. Uh, graph transformer is an early solution towards this direction. Uh, we all know that the uh, transformer is well recognized as the most powerful neural network structure in natural language processing and then readily used in ChatGPT and the various products. So a question raises as whether web transformer architecture is suitable to model graph, graph structures as well. In graph formal, the original uh, graph structure is transformed into positional encodings, and each node will directly gather information from all other nodes in the graph. There we can see three positional encodings uh, be then by the graph transformer. Here, central the encoding is added to the row of features, and uh, we have spatial encoding and edge encoding are added to the location matrix in the transformer calculation. For central encoding, it's directly used the mean degree and all degrees. For the spatial encoding and the edge encoding, since the addition matrix in transformer is the square matrix, so in graph formal, they will calculate pairwise encoding. For example, for spatial encoding, we will calculate the pairwise plotted cross distance between each pair of nodes, and for edge encoding, they will they will calculate the uh, a scalar score based on the edge, edge features. The graph formal work is uh, mainly designed for multiple graphs, and it can handle uh, graphic hundreds of nodes. But the uh, question is that 
the transformer structure it needs to have you need to com compute all the all the dependencies of, among all nodes. So we will have a square level computational complexity. So it may not be suitable for large scale social networks. So in another work, 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 it somehow addresses this problem by, by defining a smaller subgroup. For each node it, in work, work, they will sample a smaller subgroup around each target node as its neighborhood. And uh, in this subgroup, they will then drop their links and uh, regard them as a fully connected one and, and feed them into a transformer structure. In graph words, they, they, they also introduce different positional encoding methods. Okay, now we, we will move to the pre-training part. For pre-training, we usually have two main categories, namely generating methods and uh, contrasting ones. For generating methods, the first sub criteria is graph reconstruction. The main idea is to encode the input graph into representations and use another decoder to decode the representations to a reconstructed graph. Then we will measure the distance between the, the original graph and the reconstructed one at the loss. GPT-GN is an early exploration towards this direction. In GPT-GN, they will reconstruct node attributes and uh, mask the edits based on other nodes. But the question is that does reconstructing the adjacency metric is a good idea for generating a method? As the idea of reconstructing a basic metric is that a node is similar and only similar to its neighbors, but that may not be the case. So we propose an advanced method to solve this problem. Our idea is to introduce the identity of reconstruction goals. In these methods, we will so adaptively so select high similarity node pairs and uh, low similarity pairs as the positive ones to reconstruct and the negative ones to reconstruct. We also introduce um, advanced uh, bar filters to fully filter, filter out high frequency losses. Okay, another subcategory of generative methods is to reconstruct some features or more high-level semantics from the graph. In graph MAE, the architecture of graph MAE can, can be well illustrated from this figure. In graph MAE, we have an input graph here, and uh, we will mass, random mass some nodes, for example, the node two and four here, and uh, we will encode the mask graph via, via, um, via a GN encoder into node representations, and then we will try to recover the node features of the mask nodes, the node features of node two and four from all other parts via a GN, another GN decoder. So in other words, in graph MAE, we will reconstruct node features of mass nodes based on the graph structure and the information of all other nodes. In Grover, this method is used for molecule representation learning. So in this work, they will try to reconstruct some more high-level information, namely some uh, chemical properties of, the, of some uh, motifs or edges. Okay, another line of pre-training is the contrastive method. In contrastive learning, typically for each input graph, we will add, augment, add perturbations to generate two different augmentation views. Then we will try to build positive examples and negative examples from the augmented views. In in the state of contrastive learning, we usually select 
uh, for example, node A and itself as a positive pair, and node A and another, for example, a randomly selected one as a negative pair. The idea is of contrastive learning is to contrast the positive pairs versus the negative ones. Varsal is a typical method towards this area. In Varsal, we for uh, for an input graph, we will we will employ different augmentation data augmentation methods such as node dropping or ran, random energy perturbation or some masking strategies to build different augmentation views. In GraphCL, each node and itself will become a, a positive pair and a node and a randomly, a randomly uh, a selective one will become an active pair. The idea of contrastive learning is also extended to model heterogeneous graphs. In the in a representative work echo, we will generate it to contrastive views based on the concepts of uh, uh, heterogeneous networks. The first view is built based on network schema, and another view is based on metapaths. We can contrast these two views to capture the key information that will share in these views. The previous two works are based on data augmentation. Uh, now I will revisit the, the core idea of uh, contrastive le learning. In contrastive learning, we will add perturbations to the input. For example, we have a figure with an elephant in it. We can rotate the figure or zoom in or out, but these perturbations won't affect the uh, or semantics of the figure that it is still an elephant. So the idea of contrast learning is actually, is actually to capture the invariant, invariant information among different augmentation views. However, in graph contrast learning, we have few prior knowledge on how to generate such augmentations without affecting the, the core semantics. For example, in a molecule graph, if we randomly drop some nodes or edit, it will probably harm the, the chemical properties of the molecule. So in this one, we aim to find a better generative method than the dropping based on us. So in this one, we propose a completely different augmentation Paradigm, we interpret a gene as a sequence of propagation operators and the transformation operators. And uh, each specific gene encoder can be interpret interpreted as a sequence. For example, a gene can be interpreted as an iterative sequence based on the two operators. So our intuition is that different gene architectures won't affect the core semantic. So we will perturb the gene encoder instead to generate a model augmentation. Here our strategy is to introduce the perturbations. For example, in the first uh, symmetry the strategy, uh, for example, we will use a two-layer GCN to encode the first view and use a, a, another eighth layer GCN to encode another view. We also have a random and shoveling strategies to introduce extra randomness to the augmentation. We can achieve much better performance in this in random task. Okay, the second subcategory of contrast learning methods is the cross scale contrast learning. In cross in cross scale concern learning, uh, a typical work is uh, deep graph inference. In this work, a node and the graph it belongs to will become a post pair and a node with a graph is with a with a modified graph or another graph will become a active pair. This idea is actually originate from the computer vision area. 
where, uh, for example, we have a figure, a patch in a figure, and the entire figure will form will form a positive pair. Okay, now for the last part of the of the gene based method adaptation. For adaptation, we have your we have two major main paradigms. The first one is fine tuning. The fine tuning is the most widely used one before the graph foundation model mm -hmm. three uh, becomes a hot topic. The typical paradigm is we keep the input input graph intact and then we will model model parameters accordingly. But instead by the prompt engineer or prompt tuning. The prompt tuning methods, we will keep the pre-trained model intact. For example, in the right figure here, we will froze, we will freeze the pre-trained model, and instead we will model input graph or output in, in that instead. Okay, let's start from the fine-tuning part. Besides the two parameter fine-tuning, another advanced topic is parameter efficient fine-tuning shorted as PEFT here. The idea behind is that in PEFT, we will, we will pick the most parameters and we will only tell the work portion. The idea is still somehow similar to, to the LoRa technique in large language models. There are two, two recent papers published in IIII uh, 2024. They try to introduce the concept of a PFT into tuning, uh, tuning pre trained graph neural networks. The idea behind them are somehow similar, but their methods are quite different. Anyway, the idea behind it is that the more data you have to tune your model, then the more parameters that you can tune through your your fine tuning. If you have a infinite infinite data, you're totally okay to tune all your parameters. But for for example, few shock that you just you will be suggested to only tune a small parameters of your pre-trained network as a prime parameter efficient one. We recently, we also studied the problem that whether the pre-trained graph neural networks will have other trustworthy issues. In natural language process, processing, processing, recent work have shown that, that the pre-trained language models will inherit bias from pre-training corpus. Empirically, we also found that pre-trained graph neural networks will will also have such an issue. It will introduce the bias defined by sensitive attributes. So the question is how to improve the fairness of a pre-trained graph neural network. This work is also published in this conference here. Our idea is also based on the previously mentioned PFT that here we will, as shown in the figure, we will fix the pre-trained graph model here, and we will introduce an astro adapter here. The, the astro adapter has 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 uh, much fewer parameters than the pre-trained one, and the pre-trained model is somehow corrected by the by the actually uh, introduced adapter to to bring more fairness. Okay, now we will move to the last part of this of my talk, the prompt tuning methods. There are also two subcategories of this method. The first one is the pre-prompt, where we will modify the input graph. This idea is the most similar to the way we prompt the large language models, right? When we use chat GPT or GPT-4, we will we will, we can't change its parameters or any embeddings of it. We all, the only thing we can do is to 
modify our problem, our input. So this idea is to mod modify the input graph to feed to the downstream task. Another idea is the host problem, which we will, where we will modify output embedding. This idea is somehow similar to the PFT idea in the fine tuning part. Okay, a uh, typical work and uh, maybe the most uh, cited paper in the triple W conference last year, and also from the professor Fonz team, the graph prompt, the graph prompt work. In graph prompt, the paper aims to unify virus pre-training and downstream tasks. We all know that in natural language processing, different tasks can be, can be easily unified as a test-to-test -test framework. But in graph, this, this unification may not be that trivial. In the graph prompt work, they unify different tasks as the link prediction tasks. For example, if I need to predict the label of a node, I can add an extra virtual node indicating, indicating the class label and uh, try to predict a node and this virtual node for node classification. For parameter tuning, in our prompt, they introduce uh, a learnable readout layer to enable a fast adaptation based on few short examples. This idea is lately generalized to more pre-training tasks beyond link prediction. And this is another work, and this work is also incentive to handle more diverse downstream tasks and uh, namely the work is the multi-G problem work. Okay, uh, another typical work last year is the OEM one method. In the OEM one method, they formulate different, they also want to unify different tasks in the graph area and but they modify, but they, Design different tasks at the graph level task instead. But for example, they reformulate no level as level tasks all to graph level tasks. Here's just an example for no class no classification tasks. They can they can transform the no class classification task into the classification of the subgraph of the same target node. Also, the graph of the idea is also extended to heterogeneous graph recently. Uh, this work is uh, published in the New Rips 2023 last year, and it tries to, and it is uh, a pre prompt method. The previous method they are post from method, which means they know they keep the pre-trained graph neural network intact, but they will but they need to modify some readout layers or some embeddings of them. In GFM, they instead they will keep the pre-trained pre gene fixed and to adapt the pre-trained gene to downstream tasks they will tune an extra graph prompt feature instead. This graph prompt feature is an extra feature that will be added to all the, all the nodes. Okay, the GPF, the GPF method is to modify the input, the graph prompt features. And in our recent attempts, we want to directly modify the input graph the graph topology instead. For example, in the AGOD method, we aim at the OD detection problem. The idea is that in typical graph OD, OD detection methods, we need to train a specialized genes end to end for this task. But in, uh, in our paper, we want to do it in um, another way. Here in this, in the right figure, for example, we can look at the, 
the green arrows. We will pre-train the gene through the green arrows. It can be pre-trained in a self-supervised manner or a fully supervised one. After, after the pre-training, the gene is fully, will be frozen. Then to enable OD detection, we will modify the input graph instead. We will modify the edge width in the original graph to a modified one. And then we'll fit the modified graph through the blue arrows into the pre-trained gene and have the output representation. Then we will run a, a k means or some non-parametric cluster method for all the detection. So this is our, our basic idea. The idea is to keep the model key and we will modify our input to for a specific downstream task, namely all the detection. And here is our model architecture. And here is the three red rectangular is the pre-trained gene. And here is the original graph. We will train a learnable amplifier generator to generate a, an amplifier matrix. And this matrix will be added to the GCC matrix to form an amplifier graph. The idea behind is that the amplifier graph will highlight the highlights in the in distribution data. Then we also introduce a self-supervised goal to fully train all the parameters. But during the tra pre-training, the gene is al always fixed. And here are some case studies. Then we all know we, all, we know that by modifying the input graph, we can have better interpretability than other from tuning or fine tuning methods. Here, for example, for the first row, the left three three figures are in distribution graphs, and the right two one are out out of distribution samples. In this data set, a common pattern of in distribution data is that they will have a hexagon as the, as the set chain. So here, here, and here. And here the darkness of an edge is the learned weight of our method. We can see that our method can automatically the larger weight to the key patterns within the distribution data. Okay, the last word also published in the Triple W conference this year is the DCGC. In this world, we aim at the calibra calibration problem. In ca the calibration problem is, uh, is also a trustworthy issue about uh, graph neural networks, which means that uh, the class possible probability predicted by GN does not match the actual, the actual, uh, the actual accuracy of its performance. So it means that its prediction cannot well reflect its confidence. So the calibration is to align its, its confidence to its real accuracy. For most of work, they will use a post, post hoc editing strategy based on temperature scaling. We know that for classification problems, we will have a soft math operation before the final prediction. So we can tune the time temperature hyperparameter in the soft matrix operation. So we can somehow manage the confidence. This is a typical way. In our method, we also we are also inspired by the prompt prompt tuning strategy. So our idea is to is also to keep the graph neural network frozen. Instead, we will modify the input graph. Here. Uh, okay, how to modify the input graph? In this work, we, we are inspired by some data observations and uh, we will assign uh, larger ways to divisive edges that are important for label 
for cost label classification and uh, also for the homophilic edits for the nodes that are very similar. So eventually we will have a modified graph. There's a feature is, is, the, is the impact and the adjacent system metrics is modified to, intro, to incorporate these modifications. Okay, for a brief summary of the gene-based methods, the advantage of a gene-based methods towards graph foundation model is that they usually have a smaller finer parameter set, and uh, they uh, so we usually have a, a low cost of training. And uh, GA also enjoys to be their good uh, good re representation ability to encode graph structure data. So they can handle issues such as uh, permutation invariance. For example, for a for a, uh, for a recurrent neural network structure, it cannot handle this permutation inverse problem. Also, besides gene also shows strong performance in scenarios and without test data. But for the drawbacks, it, it carries limited capacity to harness intensive knowledge, for the common sense knowledge or world knowledge. And they, they, are, they will struggle to, to have more exciting emergent abilities. Also, we also have many test attributed graph, shortly like THG, and they will also underutilize this such information. Okay, this is my part of the presentation. And we will have about 15 minutes for few questions and answers for the first part. Uh, good morning. So uh, let's continue with our tutorial. So this is uh, part three. Okay, so I, I think earlier before the break, uh, Prof, uh, Prof Yu and the Shi give an introduction and overview and the Prof Yang have talked about GM-based model. So in this last part, uh, I'm going to talk about large language model based models and those that uh, combine both GN and LLM. Okay, so let's go to the LLM based models first. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, in LLM based model, we are going to talk about this in three uh, Parts. So first, we are going to talk about backbone architecture, then followed by uh, the pre-training process, and then the adaptation uh, process. And here is a, a kind of a summary table for the paper, but this table is not uh, uh, up to date, to date because you know uh, in this field is a lot of uh, new papers emerging every day. So uh, we are going to talk about some papers not here as well. All right, so uh, for the LRM based models, um, for their backbone, they, one of the common way is to convert graphs to tokens. So it's so-called graph to token method. So they tokenize graph information to align it with uh, LRM, right? Uh, for example, if you look at this example here, they, they kind of uh, describe the graph structures. For example, node four, is connected to node one and node, node three, right? So by describing the graph structures, we can convert graph to a sequence of tokens and this sequence of tokens can be input to the LLM. Then another very similar approach is graph to text. So it's actually very similar to graph to token, except that it's describing it using more natural language like style, right? So it's a, a complete sentence you can have questions, all right? And uh, describe it with, for example, the title of the paper is uh, uh, ABC and uh, the, uh, these paper cites what are the papers. So it's using a more natural language style. So, but uh, in summary, these two graph to token and the graph to text 
they are very similar, all right? Okay, this is uh, uh, one example of graph, graph to token. Okay, so given a molecule graph, they convert it to a path, all right? Based on this uh, data, they can encode the graph, uh, encode the position of this node in the graph, right? And then pass them to the transformer model. This is uh, another uh, example of graph to token. Okay, so they try to expand the vocabulary of the LLM using additional graph node features, right? So in here, each is actually a uh, description, right? So they describe the uh, uh, node, for example, uh, this node and the feature title, whatever the title, and then abstract. And you can also ask questions here, like what category should the node be classified to? So basically we expand the vocabulary by integrating node features. And these expanded features can be input into a model, right? And then solve different tasks. Uh, the next one, this simple DYG is a, a, a recent paper. It's actually by uh, our group. So it's going to be presented in uh, the main conference later. So this is a, a transformer-based approach for dynamic graph. So instead of using uh, traditional graph neural networks, we try to tokenize a graph, uh, I mean, serialize a dynamic graph into a set of sequences, right? So uh, for example, we are given this uh, eagle graph, right? We have the center node and then some other nodes. So we formulate it into a sequence. So B, C, D, E, because this is a dynamic graph. So it follows the uh, order that these nodes are connected to the center node. Okay, then we can uh, perform temporal alignment. So basically we can uh, segment the sequence based on the time, right? For example, the original sequence A, B, C, D, E. These B, C, D, E, they are connected at different time. So we can add in special token to represent different time, right? And uh, then the output of the sequence would be the uh, nodes you want to predict at a certain time, right? So let's say if we want to predict at time four, if there's this node connecting to the graph, then we put a special token time four here, right? So but the benefit of this uh, generalization is to convert the graph into sequence of tokens. So it can be input into any language model. Right, so in this case, I think we just use a GPT-2, but in fact, any other transformer-based model would work. So the, the uh, surprising finding of this paper is that we actually do not need very complicated design for modeling dynamic and the structural information. We can totally use a graph, uh, totally use a regular uh, normal transformer to deal with uh, graph learning. Right. Okay, then we move on to graph to text models. So uh, in graph to text models, they, uh, they describe the graph a bit more. So graph to token is basically describing the graph structure only. But in graph to text, we can also include various other information, not only for the graph, but also for the tasks, right? So I think here it might be a bit small to see, but the general idea is that we can describe what the task we are trying to do, for example, what is the maximum flow from node one to node three, right? Or we want to do a, a classification. We can describe the classification task using text. Okay, uh, there are some recent studies that uh, come up with a graph description language. So this is kind of like a, a XML markup, right? So the uh, basic idea is to convert the graph into a language, right? And any language model will be able to deal with it. Okay, then similar to the graph description language, uh, studies also propose this uh, graph syntax, syntax tree, right? So they organize the graph into based on their structure. For example, uh, the topological structure like one hop or two hop, right? Okay, so uh, then, puts them into a tree, 
So based on this tree, we can also uh, uh, reorganize them into input for LRM. Okay, so uh, we have described the backbone architecture, which has a graph to text or graph to token. Then we come to the pre-training part. Okay, so uh, here is a summary, right? So let's go into the details. So the pre-training of LRM model is uh, because they are using LRM. So it's basically the pre-training of an LRM. Okay, so basically we have the two category one is uh, JT tree or Llama, they are using a decoder only architecture, right? Or some uh, other methods like BERT and T5, they are using mask language modeling. So, uh, but I, I think this part, uh, if you are uh, familiar with language model, then this part is basically reusing the language model, right? So I'm going to the next part, which is the adaptation. So once we have trained, pre-trained this model, how do we adapt to our graph data and also adapt to our uh, task. Okay, so for adaptation, uh, there are two main uh, categories. One is uh, using a manual prompting. Okay, so in manual prompting, we use, uh, we, uh, use graph information and task descriptions, but these uh, descriptions are manually designed, right? For different uh, tasks and data, you may have to design different uh, descriptions. For example, here, uh, in this paper, we see that a standard prompt is just describing the graph first, right? Then you ask the question. For example, here we want to find the shortest path, right? Then your prompt question is just give the shortest path from node zero to node two, right? But this might not be effective. So you may uh, add something to uh, additional information to prompt the model. For example, you can say, let's construct a graph with nodes and edge first, all right? So by adding this prompt, the large language model, they can uh, kind of uh, understand it's kind of also related to chain of thought. They will try to internally build a graph and then uh, answer the question. But this might not be enough. So you can also give more detailed algorithms algorithm uh, prompting. For example, you can say that perhaps you can use a depth first search, right? Or some other algorithm to find process paths. So by designing these uh, uh, descriptions, we can uh, make better prompts to allow the uh, pre-trained language model to answer the graph better, right? And there's another work here is uh, uh, the syntax tree we talked about earlier, right? So we can uh, give the language model some demonstrations, right? For example, we can give them what is the uh, label of the first hop node, all right? What is the feature of the first hop node or second hop node, right? Then based on these demonstrations, the language model can learn and uh, I mean, not really learn, but uh, do inference based on the uh, manually designed prompt. But of course, the limitation of this approach is that they require manual design, right? And there is no a very principled way of doing this. You have to try a lot of uh, different design sometimes, right? So this gives us the second type of uh, uh, prompting method. They are automatic prompting, right? So in these methods, they uh, we can use the LRM as well, right? For example, we can use LRM generate some context. Okay, so in this uh, example here, the input here is some description of the graph, right? So we put into the language model. The language model can generate some additional context based on what we input, right? So the additional context here can be re-entered into the large language model to generate new context. So this is the iterative process. And after several rounds of iteration, it can output the final uh, result, right? Right, so this is the uh, uh, first part of our, uh, I mean, uh, this part. So we have covered language, large language model based uh, backbones, right? So in this uh, kind of, uh, in this category, we don't use any graph model, only language model. Right, but in the next section, I'm going to talk about GN plus large language model. So here we don't, on, uh, we not only use a large language model, 
but we also leverage graph neural networks, right? Because uh, large language models are more suitable to capture semantic information, right? Unstructured semantic information. But graph neural network is designed to capture uh, semi semi structured uh, topological information. So if we combine both, it's possible that we can leverage the best of both worlds. Okay, so in this section, uh, again, I'm going to uh, have three sub uh, sections. One is I'm going to talk about the backbone architectures, right? Then I move on to the pre-training, and finally, uh, how do we do adaptation? All right. So uh, again, here is a summary, right? So as I mentioned earlier, this table is uh, somewhat outdated. We have newer papers coming out every day. So, uh, but later in the talk, I will also introduce some of the newer works that may not be here. All right. So, in uh, for the GNN plus large language model, we have three kind of backbone architectures, right? So, one, the first kind is GNN centric, right? So, GNN centric means we mostly rely on the GNN to do prediction, right? But the large language models can provide additional feature information. The second category is the so-called uh, symmetric methods, right? So in symmetric methods, so both the GNN and LLM, they work in parallel, right? We can't say it's uh, whether it's focused on GNN or focused on LLM. Both are equally important, right? But we try to align the a representation from both GNN and LLM. And the last category is LLM centric methods, right? So in this uh, kind of uh, methods, LLM is the center component. We use LLM to do the prediction for the final task, right? The final task output is from LLM, but the GN can help to extract additional uh, information, additional features for the LRM to make the prediction. Okay, so let's come to the first uh, GN-centric method, right? So uh, in GN-centric method, you can see that uh, the final step here is using a GNN aggregator, right? Then doing a decoding to get the final task uh, output, right? But the input of the GN aggregator is not the raw node features, right? So in conventional GN, we have the uh, no, some the nodes have original features, but here we actually use a large language model to generate embeddings for the nodes, right? So we have an input graph. There is some uh, the input graph is converted to text or token sequence of tokens, then input into a language model. The language model then generate embeddings for each node, and we can use these embeddings from large language model to enhance the power of GN. All right, so this is uh, another uh, example, all right? So they start from some text attributed graph, which will convert the graph into a task, uh, uh, into a text description. They also have task description, describe what task it is. Is it a classification or a regression, right? And then they put all these, both the graph, description and task description into the large language model, right? And they then the large language model is used to initialize a prompt graph. A prompt graph is designed for each type of task, right? For classification, you have a special uh, graph. For uh, link prediction, they have another special graph. But the LRM is used to initialize the node features in this prompt graph, right? And then the output from the prompt graph is input into the a regular GN, then the regular GN uh, works on the traditional uh, node classification or graph classification or think prediction tasks. Here is another uh, pap uh, paper, but it's very similar, right? So the LRM actually appeared earlier in the pipeline, okay, because it's used to extract uh, certain information as augmentation, right? In, but in this paper, they do an additional fine tuning step. So they employ a smaller LRM, such as a BERT. They fine tune this smaller language model 
because you uh, uh, probably uh, fine tuning a large model is very expensive. So they only fine tune a small model. Then the small model will output features for graph neural networks. All right, so that's the first part, GNN based model. We use GNN to make predictions. And the second part is symmetric models. So we have two examples here. One is this called a uh, MOMU. So uh, it uses dual encoders. One is a graph encoder, the other is a text encoder. And uh, uh, we perform contrastive, contrastive learning before these two uh, modalities, right? So because uh, 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 the graph and text encoder, both encoders, they are still uh, encoding about the same input data. So they should have certain alignment between the output, right? So similarly in this uh, second paper G2P2 here, it's a similar idea. Each node have some text description. So the text encoder on this node description will output a text embedding, but the uh, graph encoder will output a node embedding. And this text embedding and node embedding, they are paired okay, because the text described each node. So they should have a, uh, uh, they should be aligned, closely aligned in the embedding space. And lastly, we have LM centric methods. So in uh, these methods, we have uh, two uh, recent paper. Okay, one is graph GPT, right? So, um, so graph GPT applies a GN earlier, right? The GN will be used to extract structural information from the graph and then undergoes a projection. So the projection is to align the uh, GN embedding with the large language models uh, embedding, right? Then it's input into a large language model, right? So uh, finally, the prediction will be made by the large language model. Okay, and then uh, in a uh, second paper graph translator, this is uh, from Professor Shu's team. Right, so it's actually accepted to uh, W and it will be presented later in the main conference, right? So in this paper, they have designed a producer to generate more information about the graph, right? And then go through a translator module. The translator module employs uh, uh, different mechanisms such as cross attention. And this translator module try to map the GNN output for use in the large language model. Okay, so uh, we have talked about the backbone architecture, then we move on to the pre-training. Okay, so, um, so depending, uh, because we have both uh, GN and LM, so we need to do pre-training for both uh, models, right? And uh, for some model, we also need to do alignment, right? Because we want to align the graph and text uh, representations. Okay, so this uh, G G A L M, okay, graph aware language model pre training. Okay, so basically it's a uh, it's a uh, co training based approach, right? So it uh, after it uh, trained uh, pre trained the language model, uh, it transfer the information to the GN and the GN, the output of the GN can go back to supplement the input graph. So it's a co-training type of a, a paradigm. Okay, there is also contrastive learning. It's a alignment based, right? So uh, this is this is the example from uh, uh, on a molecule uh, prediction task. So there are two uh, modality. One is the molecule structure, right? So we have a graph encoder to get the molecule uh, encoding uh, embedding. And then we have the corresponding text description of the molecule, okay? Then using a text encoder, we can get the text embedding. And because this text is describing the molecule, so the graph embedding for the molecule should be aligned with the text embedding with, uh, for the same molecule, right? So we try to align this, but of course, there's also negative samples. If we have a different molecule, 
then we show the contrast between them, right? So they're embedding from different molecules to be different. This is another paper, right? Called G2P2. Uh, this paper is similar to the previous work, but it employs some uh, additional contrastive strategy. So for example, beyond the node te uh, text and node alignment, they also proposed text summary and text alignment. Because you know the graph has a structure, each node have a neighborhood. So if you take a look at the text from the neighboring nodes, it actually forms a summary of the center node, right? So we can also contrast or align between the summary and the center node, right? Or the summary of the text with the center node's description, right? So these two additional contrastive strategies can improve the performance. Okay, finally, we come to the uh, adaptation. Okay, so after we have pre-trained the models, we haven't uh, uh, started working on the downstream tasks and there are different downstream tasks. How can we apply the model and adapt them to solve the downstream tasks? So this is the key question. So there are two types of uh, uh, adaptation. One is traditional, uh, one is fine tuning. Okay, but fine tuning has two versions. One is a vanilla fine tuning, right? Which you update all the parameters. Okay, this is computationally intensive and uh, probably uh, we can't really afford it if we want to fine tune for every task, right? A more practical solution is parameter efficient fine tuning. So we only fine tune a subset of parameters. So this would be more efficient and uh, uh, resource friendly, right? Another category is prompt tuning, right? So we insert additional learnable vectors into the model, right? And we only tune these additional vectors. We don't touch the original model at all. Okay, one example is graph tra translator, right? So in their model, they actually freeze both the graph model and the large language model. Right. They only tune the producer model and the translator model. Okay, so the producer model is actually producing more data to enrich the original graph, right? To do better alignment. And the translator model is to convert the node representations into large language model. I mean, for large language model to understand and predict, right? So they only tune these two uh, parts without changing the a large language model. So it's a very uh, efficient and uh, uh, requires much less resource, right? So the producer uses a chain of thought idea, right? So the chain of thought is basically to allow the large language model to generate high quality description, right? So instead of just asking one question, you can ask the large language model to think step, step by step. Right to introduce uh to allow large language model to give more a uh, reasonable output. Okay, and then uh we'll have to design some uh, prompt template, okay, for the uh, large language model to take in as input. Okay, so during the training step, we only fine tune the translator and the projector, and the training step itself is divided into two stages. Stage one is to align the graph and text, right? The second stage is to align the graph with the large language model. Okay, and uh, during the first stage, the training part, various uh, uh, object objectives are introduced. For example, the contrastive objective, try to align the node and text, right? So this is a high level alignment, but there is also more fine grained alignment, right? like this matching objective. So basically uh, they designed the, both the uh, high level and the detailed level alignment. And there's also a generative objective, right? So given the node, can we generate the text, right? So the alignment is different from generative. Alignment is mutual. We want to make the node similar to text and the text output embedding should be similar to node. But generative objective is one way, given the node, can we recover the text, right? So this is a, a detailed training strategy. 
And stage two involves the projection, right? So we need to project the graph output to the representation space of the large language model, right? So there are uh, ways such as uh, doing a concatenation, right? And then we will need to fine tune the translator. Okay, so only this translator is fine tuned without touching the large language model. Here is another uh, paper, right? So it's a graph GPT. Okay, so I think the idea is uh, pretty much similar to the graph translator. So they have, they also have a projector module, right? So they map the graph representation to LRM. All right, and they only fine tune the projector using the instruction instruction tuning, right? So they have this example instructions and the ground truth, right? And these are mostly manually designed. So this uh, instruction will allow uh, them to fine tune the projector. Right, so in um, P2P2, this paper, they uh, don't design a manual prompt, right? So they use a learnable prompt. So the benefit of learnable prompt is that you, you don't have to uh, redo the design if you change to a different kind of graph data or different domain, right? So you can let the uh, model to learn the prompts themselves, right? So um, so basically these H here are just learnable vectors, right? So uh, during the uh, during the adaptation stage, we don't update the text encoder. We don't update the uh, graph encoder. We only update this uh, very small learnable prompt here, right? Okay, then there is also a recent paper in iClear24. Okay, so they try to propose a prompt tuning method. They, they, their paper is called one for all, right? Because they want to uh, kind of uh, align different kind of task in one framework. So basically they need to use additional constructs like this so-called NOI, node of interest, right? And they design different NOI graph for different tasks like node level task, they need a special NOI for link level task. It's about a pair of nodes. Then they also need another NOI. And for graph level, it's a subgraph but they basically convert all the graphs into this so-called NOI graph, right? And they are also a prompt node, right? So this prompt node is like a, a virtual node. It's not in the graph, but they artificially created this node and they describe the feature and the examples of this prompt node, right? So for example, you can include the task description into the prompt node, like Let's do graph classification, right? On molecule property, or let's do node classification on the category of a scientific paper, right? And they also have class node, right? Because if you are doing classification, you need a, a description of the categories, right? So each class would have some description, right? So based on this uh, NOI prompt node and class node, we can. Uh, uh, do right. So I think uh, this is uh, the two uh, parts: the LM-based models, GN, and the LM-based models. Right. Of course, earlier before the break, we also uh, discussed about the uh, GN-only model. So finally, let me give a, a summary and outlook of the. LM-based model and LM-plus uh, GM-based models. Okay, so first, the advantage of leveraging LM is to allow a unified approach to various tasks using natural language description, right? So whatever your task is, whatever your, whatever your graph is, whatever is the domain, whether it's a biology or social network, we can always use some natural language to describe it. So that's the power of using a large language model here because we can simply use language as a medium to bridge all these different uh, tasks and uh, domains, right? 
And uh, uh, a large language model potentially can also merge different modality, right? If we translate the graph data into sequence of tokens, okay? As we have seen, there are graph to token and graph to text assets. Then the LRM can handle both the uh, uh, unstructured natural language and uh, structured graph data. So this paves a promising path for graph foundation models. And finally, uh, because graph neural networks is uh, good at capturing very precise structural information, right? So it might be helpful if we combine both GN and LLM. So as we can see earlier, there are three different categories. One is uh, focusing on GN, using GN as prediction, but LRM is just kind of like uh, enriching the features. But we can also do the other way around. LRM is the main predictor, but we use GN to extract structural information and enhance the LRM. And it can also be a parallel kind of situation. We have both GN and LRM, they work in parallel and we try to align their uh, representation space. All right, and then uh, we are, uh, here are some outlook, all right, and potential uh, to consider in future research, right? First is how do we resolve LRM as LRM's limitations, right? For example, LRM may not be very good at doing multi-hop reasoning, right? It may not be able to capture graph topology in a very precise manner. So even though you can convert graph data into tokens, right? But uh, uh, it may not understand and capture the full topo topological structure, right? And there are also very diverse graph data, like uh, 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 Prof. Yu and Shi mentioned in the overview part. There are graphs like homogeneous graph, which is a, a regular node and edge graph, but there is also heterogeneous graph. We have different types of nodes, different types of edges. We have a relational graph like graph, knowledge graph. We also have dynamic graph where we have time information. So given this diverse graph data, uh, perhaps uh, we need to employ specialized uh, graph model instead of just relying on LRM. Okay, and we also need to deal with efficient training methods to manage high-dimensional costs and data requirements, right? Because once we involve a large language model, we will need a lot of resources even to fine tune it, right? So even if we are just fine-tuning a small part, it's uh, it's going to require extensive uh, GPU resources, right? Not to mention if you want to train from scratch, then that's a, a very prohibitive cost. So how do we manage the high computational cost, right? And of course, we also need a lot of data. So I think one disparity between current graph learning and uh, lang natural language is that in natural language, we have a lot of data. Right, you have the whole Wikipedia, New York Times, and the whole internet. They have a lot of text info, text data. But in graph domain, we have very limited uh, uh, data. Right. Many social networks or e-commerce graphs, although they are large, they, you can have billions of nodes in like Facebook or, or Twitter, but they are private. They are not uh, public available, all right? And other domains like molecules, they need a lot of human curation. So the current data set for biology graphs, they are still quite limited and uh, small in quantity. Okay, and uh, we can also think about what kind of applications there can be, right? So um, especially in multimodal and cross-modal tasks, right? I think later on, uh, we will have an interactive panel. So in the panel, we will discuss more questions in detail, right? Okay, I think that's the end of this part. Um, maybe any question for this part? I can take maybe one or two questions. So no questions? Okay, maybe, uh, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, uh, in the, the third part, is the uh, GNM part, LM, yeah. Uh, I am not sure that, that Different from the above uh, types. Yeah, your your um, in this type you have a uh, centric and LM centric. What's the difference from the above types? 
Okay. I think the picture is very, very tiny. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, that's a good question. So, um, so the LRM plus GNN, it basically means we use both of them. It doesn't mean that we only use one of them. So we use both LRM and GNN in the LRM plus GNN type, but we have different focus. In some paper, so let me go to the slides. So oh, sorry, it's very slow here. Okay, so we have three subcategories actually. Okay, so uh, okay, yeah, we have uh, can be gen centric. So that means we use gen as to make predictions. So the final task output is made by the GM. So GM makes the final prediction. LRM is just use the additional information to input into GN. Uh, then the last category, LRM centric is the opposite. LRM makes the prediction. And GM just to extract additional information to input into the LRM. And there is a middle type is the symmetric where we Use both, right? Both are in parallel, both have equal weight, right? We try to align their representation. So I think they are indeed they are very similar. They use both GN and LRM, but it's just their uh, focus and emphasis is different. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if no other questions, oh, one more question. Okay, I think that's a very interesting question. Yeah, but at the moment, I think there isn't consensus on which way is superior. All right, all of them are in very early stage. So I think different have different different methods have different advantages, right? For example, uh, the LRM centric method, because the final prediction is uh, from an LRM. So if the task is more semantic related, more related to natural language, then perhaps the LRM centric method is better. But if the final uh, answer is for the focus class or what's the uh, uh, graph theory related, maybe a GN method is better. So I think if the uh, best method for everything, it depends on the situation. Yeah. Okay. So because we believe uh, if you directly use uh, GN alone, uh, it can extract the topology, right? But uh, we, uh, I, I think, so the note feature may also play a uh, helping with the structure learning. For example, we have homophily graph and heterophily graph, right? In homophily graph, and uh, how the features are structured is different from heterophily graph, right? So if you bring in the note features, it can be, uh, help you to decide better if this is a heterophily graph or homophily graph. So that's why if we have more feature information, like uh, additional text information, then perhaps it can actually improve the learning of structure. So we think these two parts, structure and the feature, is they, they, are, they can mutually influence each other. Okay, I, I think due to time constraint, let's move on to the 